So I'll jump right in, um, briefly introduce everyone. Uh, we have Elizabeth Glazer, the Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, New York City Council Members Keith Powers, Jumani Williams, Robert Holden, and Joseph Borelli, as well as James Quinn, Senior Executive Assistant District Attorney in the Queen's DA's office, and Elias Hussamadeen, uh, who we just heard from. And so, to kick it off, I'd like to ask the panel as a whole, again, the first question that I asked Elias, uh, can the city close Rikers in nine years? Should it do so, and why? And we'll start at the far end. Great. Um, so uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the answer is it's a steep hill. Uh, and I think Elias raised a number of the reasons why. Um, we think it's the right thing to do, which is the reason why we want to do it. We think that, um, that uh, jails work better when they're in uh, neighborhoods, when people who are uh, incarcerated are closer to families and lawyers. Um, We've seen that jails actually have become civic assets in our city. We see what's happened, uh, for example, in downtown Brooklyn uh, around that jail. Um, and we think it's possible. Uh, the first thing we have to do is get the population down. Uh, that is critical. Uh, New York City already has uh, the lowest incarceration rate of any city in the nation. Um, almost half of what uh, Chicago and LA has. Um, the population has changed quite a bit uh, in the past two decades, and the folks who are in there are charged with uh, felonies, about 97% of them, about half of those with violent felonies. Uh, and so getting the population down further uh, is definitely an important thing uh, and a hard thing. Uh, we've gotten the population down about 20% uh, in the last four years, even as crime has gone down. Um, to get it down further will mean we have to shorten the amount of time that people stay there, which means that the courts and DAs and defenders have to uh, kick in in a very major way uh, to j deliver justice in a speedy way. Uh, we definitely, as, as Elias very eloquently sort of outlined, need to change the culture inside. We need to make things better for both officers and staff who work there uh, and for people who are incarcerated uh, because uh, it's the right thing to do, uh, and also because we are going to be on Rikers Island for a while while we build. And finally, and a number of council people are here um, who obviously play an important part in that, uh, we need to be able to build the kinds of facilities uh, that are actually going to produce uh, a smaller, safer, uh, and fairer justice system. And that means uh, places that are not as dilapidated as Rikers, but more affirmatively, places that uh, have light and air uh, and encourage and have space for the kinds of activities um, that both produce uh, productive lives and reduce violence. Thank you, Elizabeth. Borough President? Uh, uh, just immediately, yes, but it has to be done right. But I also want to uh, deal with some underlying um, parts here because I may not get the mic again because this is a long list of folks. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Elias. And I know what some of you were saying as Elias was speaking. Um, hey, look at this angry black man. Uh, and if he's not angry, he's not human. And the comments he made, even to say, I don't want members who tarnish the shield to be part of our industry never has any law enforcement union president ever said that. Never. Never. They embrace them. They hide them. They protect them. He has made it clear. When you look at what is happening in Rikers and to members of the Department of Correction, it is a well-known secret, overwhelming, overwhelmingly a union of color, the inmates are of color. There has been a mindset in the law enforcement community for years, let the savages kill each other. They have not received the right amount of tools that they need. Push them off to Rikers Island. We don't see them again. So what? Let's act like they're not even here. DOC members 
have been stating for years, there's a problem here. Too many gangs, too much violence, not enough recreation, recreation, having inmates sit around, fight each other. No one has listened to them. And Elias has, has been doing an unbelievable job of pointing out, we will never allow police officers to be under the condition that members of the Department of Correction are under, never. You will never allow a police officer to be ambushed, never. This entire city would change rules and policies to prevent it from happening. But you're allowing a predominant black and Hispanic uh, union and membership to go through this. Oh, Eric, stop playing the race card. Well, that's the only goddamn card in the deck. And this, what is happening to these officers for years, I saw it for 22 years as a police officer, what has happened to members of the Department of Correction. And every young person that is in the Department of Correction are not there merely because they did not get enough hugs from their mother. Some of them are violent. Some of them have committed violent acts. And the culture of violence, if you do it incorrectly of closing Rikers, you're going to take that culture and you're going to move it to the borough jails that you're moving it through. You have to deal with the underlying issues of what has happened in Rikers Island, not dealing with some of the real issues that are happening to young people when they get there and before they get there. And that is important. We can't sugarcoat this. It's not about just closing a piece of real estate and moving it to another piece of real estate. It's about dealing with the real issues of violence on Rikers and what are the conditions that causes the violence. Like 50% of the children who are on Rikers Island, I learned a couple of years ago, are dyslexic. Think about that number. 50% of them are dyslexic. So if you didn't get the care you needed in early diagnosis when you were in school of dyslexia. You start going on the corner slinging drugs. You start carrying a gun. You start using the gun. Then you end up in Rikers only because you didn't get the services you needed because you, people didn't understand why you couldn't read and write. So yes, we can close Rikers. But we need to listen to those members of the Department of Correction who are on the ground to talk about how do we do it in an, in an effective manner that we're not going to harm correction officers, we're not going to harm, harm innocent civilians, and guess what? We're not going to harm the inmates themselves. If it's not done correctly, we're going to move the culture of violence from the island to the boroughs and the communities. I'm in favor of the closure, but it must be done correctly. Thank you, Borough President. Uh, Councilman Powers, who I should note is the new chair of the Correction Committee in the Council. Uh, and criminal Justice, but we oversee criminal the justice. Sessions Committee. Right. I, and, and that's a good, good segue just to note that we have a number of folks who are from the Department of Corrections, Rikers Commission. We do have Stanley Richards here as well, who I think is a fantastic appointee. And I think that somebody who's actually has real life experience, whether it's, it may not be working in the jail, but I think is actually an important voice in that conversation. And I, and then, uh, members from the uh, uh, people from the Department of Probation and folks from City Council as well. So thank you for putting this on. Uh, we took a tour of Rikers Island last week, and I was I was happy that both Stanley and Elias joined us because I thought we had a very productive conversation about uh, the safety of both the people that are residing on Rikers Island and the people that are working there. And I thought that in addition to the regular tour we would have gotten to have those two be able to add their voices and. I think Councilmember Holton would agree was actually a really important conversation, and I, I note that Stanley Richards and I just I think two days ago had a follow-up conversation about that exact discussion around safety and ways that the, the City Council and the Board of Corrections can ensure the safety of the people that are working there, and to ensure that as either the transition happens to close Rikers Island, but also in the in the 10 years or five years or whatever the number we're using now is, um, that it's it's fixed immediately. And so I, I don't think that the voices aren't being heard. And in fact, I, I think it was a productive conversation that has, uh, has, a, has some ways to go. Um, I, look, I think, we're on a, I think we are on a path to close Rikers Island. I don't think the, the reality versus uh, dream versus reality conversation is really one we're having anymore. I think that we, we have committed to a timeline and a process. Elias is correct, though. There are still hurdles in that process, even tonight. There's conversations in the Bronx about the facility that is due to be located there. And so saying that we have a process does not mean we have new buildings built. We still have a long way to go to actually get the facilities built. But I think we are, if to ask for the timeline, I think the timeline that we're talking about right now and 
think the Litman Commission talked about the other day as well, is if, if we get certain procurement design build rules, it could be as fast as 6.5 years, 7 years, and it could be 9 or so if we, if we don't get those rules. And it's important to me that we, we are able to do those uh, uh, faster uh, to commit ourselves to the process. The, um, the one thing I want to contest that was said earlier is that the corrections is the last place for people. It's, it's, it's not. It's the streets of New York City are the last place that anybody who's there, it comes back. That is why we have to have a commitment, well, both to the safety of everybody in the, in the jail, but also that's why when we talk about safety and security, it's, it's recognizing that the last stop isn't the jail or isn't prison, that many of these people are going to be back in our community and are members of our community and that we have a right and responsibility to keep them safe and to ensure that when they come back out that we have appropriate services for them, we can help them find a job, we can help them find housing, but also that when they're, when they are, when they're residing on Rikers Island, that we are not, we are viewing them as members of the community and members of our community again in the future. So I, I just want to contest that because I think that's actually an inappropriate view, although I understand, I understand where it came from, but I think it's the view that we should all have is that we are, we are living amongst, we are walking amongst, we are here amongst people that are going to spend time in Rikers Island. I know people who spend time in Rikers Island. They're my friends. And so the idea that we're not, we're treating them as that's the last stop, it's, it's, I think it's an actually an incorrect view. And that's why I view this as a responsibility that we have as a, as a city and as a city council and as legislators. Thank you. Councilman Williams. Thank you. I'm going to try to get some in too, because I too think eight, eight people is a lot. Um, <laughs> Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that this is the uh, most disciplined, quietest protest I've seen in a long time. Uh, so that's awesome. But I do want to highlight one thing. Uh, where are the voices of the formerly incarcerated? Because very often we have these discussions and don't include the people uh, who are closest to the problem and may have a good voice of how to get the solution. So I just want to highlight that because I think it's very important. We tend to do it a lot. I also uh, try to start from a bird's eye. And so the bird's eye, I always say, um, to me, the system is not broken. It's working how it was designed to operate uh, from the beginning of this country. And so people who are in certain places have certain privileges and people who don't. Uh, this is how the country was designed uh, on purpose. And so for me, it's not never about fixing a broken system. It's about changing the system entirely. And because if you have a house that has a small crack, it's easy to kind of fix that. If the foundation of the house is jacked up, uh, you have a harder thing to do, and we should be talking about fixing the found or uh, changing the foundation so that it's it's better. And um, just so folks realize, in the country, we represent about four percent of the population. We have twenty five percent of the world's prison population. So every fourth person that is in prison in this world is in the United States of America. Although we only represent four uh, percent, I think eighty percent of the people in Rikers are uh, black and brown. I don't think that's by accident. I don't think anybody who studies this stuff believes it's by accident. That is important because I believe if the population looked different, um, the discussions would be different much, much earlier. And so if the population reversed, it was 80% white children that were there, we would immediately understand what needs to be done. We would immediately understand the inhumane conditions. I believe, is, as was pointed out, if the union was 80% white, there would be different discussions of how to do it. I believe. Their voices have not been at the table in a meaningful way, and I hope the administration will allow that uh, to be to happen because I think their voices are important as well. Violence is violence, and I want to make sure it stops all over. But the way we have the system now, it is designed, I believe, for this type of violence. It's not, it's not uh, designed for corrections. It's designed to house people. Um, we have to remember that most of the people there are innocent, at least that's what we say. We probably would say more often if the complexion of them looked differently. Um, but the majority of people there have not been proven guilty of anything. And we just we call them inmates, we call them whatever, and we push them to the side. It's important to say that. And if you don't believe me, we can look at the way things happen, the same thing. So we look at what's happening with the opioid crisis now, the heroin crisis, how people are being viewed. It's amazing they're being viewed as human beings. Can you imagine that? Drug people. People who are, uh, bu uh, who are addicted to drugs being treated as human beings who need assistance. And we look at what's happening uh, with marijuana, and we look at what's happening with the crack cocaine in the same community. Even as we're legalizing marijuana, we still have not looking at people who are in jail uh, for selling the same product. Even as we're legalizing marijuana, we are, not, we are saying people who have criminal records cannot access 
that pipeline to sell. We can look at the same drug, heroin, in the 60s and 70s, uh, when the complexion was different then. How are those people treated? So it's not uh, hyperbole to say people are treated differently depending on the amount of melanin in their skin. Also, generally speaking, we want to keep the system going because we are trained to believe that the answer to public safety is locking up as many black and brown people as humanly possible. We also show from the data that that does not work. And so many of the work I and others did many years ago around uh, criminal justice issues, stop, question, frisk, gun violence, we were told by many of the same people who tell us now that we are not looking at this properly, that the sky would literally crack open, black and brown people would fall from it, start killing each other, and destroy the entire city. They couldn't have been more wrong. And so uh, as of last year, the city's the safest it's been since 1951. Um, and I, I thank a lot of people for that, including the NYPD who have in charge of law enforcement, not necessarily to be equated for uh, uh, equated to public safety. That's a broader discussion. And I say that to say people have never been right about this who says we're wrong in trying to do this more humanely. Never. And normally people don't get less safe, we get more safe. Um, and we have to look at this thing as a whole. And so when you have a Rikers Island named after a slave catcher pushed to the side, uh, that is a problem that we have to look at. And I agree the culture of violence has to be looked at and how we do it better. Um, but we should be all starting from the same framework of reference of what's happening and why. There's always people saying, no, don't do any reforms. Uh, these are people leave them to their own devices. They're always saying that. And they are always wrong. And unfortunately, whether it is consciously, subconsciously, uh, specifically, or just in the system, that is usually based on who we're talking about and what they look like. Uh, but to the answer of your question, um, I think um, I wanted to see closed in, in nine years. I would actually like to see it closed faster, and so I would like a faster timeline. Part of that is because I just want to see it happen. Another part is government historically doesn't hit timelines. <laughs> so if you aim for nine, I don't know what it's really going to be. And so why not aim for five and see what we can do? Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Holden. Uh, I want to thank you for this. We need more debate on this, uh, and it has to go on. I Coming into the city council, this seemed like a done deal to close Rikers, which I couldn't understand. Um, visiting Rikers, I got a very different view than my colleague uh, Powers, uh, Councilman Powers. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting. The security, just to go through, to get on the island is, is kind of difficult. To get off, we had a problem getting off the island. Um, you had to go through a bunch of checkpoints, so you had to turn over your, your ID. And, and the problem that, that I see here is security, um, at least in the community jails. If you're going to propose community jails, unless you're putting a moat with alligators around the, uh, the, the structure, there's going to be a problem. For instance, a um, gentleman got out last year um, of, I think, a jail. He couldn't get off the island. I mean, look at the island. Look, look at what's surrounding it. Um, to me, this seems like a land grab. And, there's a number of issues, obviously, but then look at the price tag on this thing. I think it's between 10 and 11 billion to build community jails and to close Rikers. Um, even though I heard that the city is going to invest a billion dollars into Rikers be before they close it, which is a mistake. Um, don't know if that's totally true. The city has a lot of um, building to do, by the way. How about our, our transit system? Uh, for instance, uh, how much of investment is there? Has, we have to put big money into, into our transit system, yet um, where we want to actually build community jails, which would be less secure um, than Rikers. Rikers is the most secure jail that I've seen. Well, uh, also, look at the incarceration rate. We, we're the, by far the lowest of any big city in the United States. I think it's now down to 165. Compare that with cities like Philadelphia, which I think is something we're in the 800 per 100,000. So we are, so if to cut that in half, I think is irresponsible. Um, for instance, uh, you know, getting, de getting down, where does uh, 5,000 come from? Uh, the mayor has all these lofty goals, but where did that come from, 5,000? Did he talk to the DAs? I know the Queens DA, James Quinn, by the way, assistant DA, uh, laid out a very good, um, you know, I think he might even have some uh, posters and, and some facts and figures that he's going to talk about, which um, I, I've 
been to the debate where he was featured, and Elias is providing tremendous leadership. But we need to actually look, at, and the Lippmann Commission didn't look at this, rebuilding Rikers, make, modernize it. You can make it bright and airy. You can have these wonderful programs there. So why do we have to replicate, and by the way, there are wonderful programs, 16 and 17 year olds are getting an education, mandatory. If they're incarcerated there for any length of time, they go to classes, wonderful, mandatory. The problem is the 18 to 21 year olds don't have to. And as, as we saw on our, our tour, only about 10% of the 18 to 21 year olds take advantage of that. I think that should be mandatory for 18 to 21. Uh, because 40% of them come back to Rikers. So that's, that's the thing. Education is very, very important. Rather than idle time sitting around in, in a jail, they could, you can educate them. So offer those, um, those programs. And there's many other things you can do with Rikers, but certainly rebuilding has to be an option, which I have, rebuilding Rikers, modernize it, it has to be an option. And why it hasn't been discussed even, I don't, uh, it, it's, it's bewildering, but um, I think at this point, um, and I think I speak for my constituents, um, is that we don't want a jail and everything that comes with it. We don't want correction uh, vehicles all over the place, police, uh, uh, lawyers. Uh, if you look at, and the proposal is the Queen's House detention um, to house them. By the way, 450, by the way, can fit there now, 450 um, prisoners, a far cry. And you know, if you look at the, the total number right now, 9,000, you're just picking a goal of, to, to cut down the population. But it's just, I don't see, I don't see that it can work. So I don't want, right now, the courts, around the courts, I think in every borough, it, well, very congested. You're going to add jails, and you're going to, you're going to add uh, lawyers, cars, you're going to add correction vehicles, you're going to add um, people visiting. I think that is a huge problem, certainly for the neighborhoods. So um, I, I, of course, they can close Rikers. I just don't see that's a, a great option. And I, don't, I think it's a tremendous waste of resources. Certainly, it's a tremendous waste of money. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Borelli. Thank you, John. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks, city and state. And uh, I want to echo what Bob Holden said. I, too, do not want to see any lawyer's vehicles uh, in my district whatsoever. That's <laughs> the last thing we need. <laughs> Time of breakfast. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not here uh, today to uh, necessarily tell you that I'm opposed to the closing of Rikers Island. Uh, I think any concerns that I have are more about the future safety of officers and inmates. And to piggyback on something that Jumani uh, had said, and, and he's someone that I respected and, and we're friends and, and we agree and disagree. Um, the thing that was predicted was that after the reform of punitive segregation for the younger inmates, the, the incidence of violence would rise. And that has happened. I mean, that, that is something that we statistically track and we can see that that has been the result. I, I'm not sure from a, a correction officer or an inmate standpoint, especially when many of the advocates have been making the case that people tend to get caught up in the system on Rikers Island they get involved in the culture, the culture essentially leads them to, to extend their stays. Why you would want the one to two to three percent of the population to not be segregated, to not be punished when these type of incidents occur. Um, you know, to hear Elias talk, and, and, and we had had this conversation earlier, that even now these inmates can't be denied commissary. You know, can, can we all perhaps agree that if you slash a, a correction officer or you slash a fellow inmate, Maybe you don't get beef jerky that week. Like, is that is that too much to ask that maybe some of your rights get rolled back a little bit? Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but to answer your original question, uh, should it? Yeah, maybe, maybe. I, I think there is the need for reform. I think uh, the right way was to start by rebuilding jails, modern jails that limit the interaction between COs uh, and inmates in, in moments where there could be danger. I think that's certainly something that should happen. There's money in the budget for that already that, that's sort of been held up because of this debate. Um, but your original question was nine years. So on March 8th, 2027, if anyone wants to take this action, they're, they're welcome to. I would bet my entire house in life savings that the keys to Rikers Island are not handed over to the Port Authority or to the, some real estate developer, whoever it is. 
The city of New York can't build a baseball field in nine years, right? There's a baseball field in my district. If I ask Bob, if I ask Keith or Jumani, there are examples of, you know, the Parks Department or anyone not being able to build the most simple things <coughs> that we could possibly provide as a city in our district. So now you're adding um, the ULERT process. You're adding uh, a, a, a very vocal uh, debate over the siting of these jails. It takes, on average, for Parks Department five to six years from when OMB authorizes the money to be spent for the actual playground or whatever it is to be, to be built. We're not even near that point yet. And that brings us to a, a second point. Now, there's no, there hasn't been an updated uh, estimate since the mayor announced the four locations of the jails. And I imagine the number may come down as we may be using some existing facilities. But let's just go on that $10.5 billion uh, example. Where does the city get that? And I'm not saying that, that flippantly. Right now, we authorize $8 billion a year, $9 billion a year in capital spending. We issue debt, we build capital projects. Where does that actual, how can we double that? You know, will we be able to even float bonds to issue debt to actually build this thing? Uh, obviously, it, it probably can't be done in one year. To give you a comparison, the state of New Jersey, the entire state of New Jersey, I just looked it up before I came, is spending $1.6 billion a year in their entire state capital plan. Right? And that includes their Department of Corrections. The number is, is a problem in and of itself. And whether it can be done in one year, I think, is impossible. I think the financing would have to be done over multiple years. And then there and goes, refers back to my first point, that there's no way, it's delusional to even be trying to be planning that this facility would be closed by 2027. Um, I think if we're operating under that assumption, we're making uh, some mistakes, and that should be the starting point of the conversation as to what is a realistic goal uh, of, of shutting down Rikers Island. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's taken a half hour for one question, so I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate it. Uh, Elias, anything to add? We already got this question to you. No. Okay. We'll go right on to uh, James Quinn. Um, quite frankly, I don't, I don't know where to start. Um, there are a lot of myths about Rikers Island and closing of Rikers Island. The, the short answer to your question, uh, should it be closed? I don't know. Can it be closed? Not under the present, any present proposal. Uh, and can it be closed safely? No. Uh, that's the short answers. Right now there are 91, 9,000, about 9,000 people on Rikers Island. The city and the Lippman Commission recommended that that number be reduced to 5,000 in order to close Rikers Island, which means you have to reduce the population by 4,000 inmates uh, within the next 10 years. But when you look at the inmates who are in Rikers Island, there are a lot of myths about them. The, the myths started out that there were all these fair beaters in Rikers Island. There's not a single fair beater from Queens held on Rikers Island solely for fair beating. What they're held on is the gun that was found on them when they were arrested for fair beating. That's what they're being held on. There, there, were, uh, there was a big article in the New York Daily News when this first started that there were so many prostitutes in Rikers Island. We did a search. There's not a single person being held solely on prostitution from Queens on Rikers Island. We then started to look at all the uh, defendants who are actually in Rikers Island. And if I can use my charts. You didn't say we could bring visual aids. Come on. I mean, yeah, this, is, this is. In fact, I said we couldn't do presentations, but <laughs> yeah. let's go ahead. This is Rikers Island inmate population as of January 25th of 2018. Mike, Mike. This is the population in Rikers as of January 25th of 2018. There were 9,010 inmates on, on January 25th. Now, everybody says that all these people are being held on, on awaiting trial. Well, that's not quite true. 2,000 of them are sentenced prisoners, which brings the number down to 7,000 people who are being held uh, awaiting trial. Of those 7,000 people being held awaiting trial, there are only 3,330 of them who are being held solely because they can't make bail. All the others are being held on violations of parole, violations of probation. Um, they're remanded because they violated a, a, an order of uh, protection. They're being remanded because of things that they've done while they were out. They were out on a robbery bail, and they got arrested for another robbery, and the judge remanded them. So you wind up only 48% of the pretrial detainees, the people awaiting trial, are bailable. That's 3,300. 
In order to reduce the population by 4,000, you have to release every single one of these 3,330 people have to leave Rikers. And then you have to find 700 more of the people who can't be released because they've got all these holds on them. So what we did, we looked at the people who comprise the bailable defendants who are held on Rikers. Oh, we got more. <laughs> I, I got loads of that. <laughs> we looked at the people from Queens who are held on bail. Um, now these are the people who if they made bail would get out. All right, the only thing holding them is bail. We looked at the A felonies. You know, there's a, a myth that there are all these people being held on nonviolent felonies and for misdemeanors, being held just because they can't make $500 bail. You know how many people are being held on Rikers Island? Rikers Island has 9,000 defendants. 17, 1,800 of them are from Queens. Do you know how many of those people, don't look at the chart yet, do you know how many of those people are being held simply because they can't make bail being held on an A misdemeanor, 43. All right, that's another myth about Rikers Island, that there are all these people being held in these minor charges. So then we started, look, looked at the people who held in the nonviolent D's and E's. These are the car thefts, they're the, um, uh, the people who uh, uh, are stealing checks and employee theft and, and uh, 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 minor grand larcenies, things like that. The nonviolent defendants who are being held. For D felonies, there are 112. Do you know what their records look like? They have an average of 6.6 .6 prior felony arrests, one and a half felony convictions, seven misdemeanor arrests, eight misdemeanor convictions, and three prior failures to appear in court. Those are the nonviolent defendants who have to be released. Every one of these people has to be released in order to reduce the population on Rikers. You look at the nonviolent E felonies, there are only 39 of them who are being held solely because they can't make bail. They have an average of almost seven prior felony arrests, one and a half felony convictions, almost nine prior misdemeanor arrests, almost 10 prior misdemeanor convictions, and almost three prior felonies to appear. Those are averages? These are averages. These are the people who have to be released in order to get the population down to 5,000. The, the, uh, the, the concept that you can do that safely is, I mean, it's almost ludicrous that, to think that you can do that and release these people um, and not have an impact on the public safety of the people of the city of New York. We looked at, you know, there was some talk about how. And if we could uh, streamline it, just, oh, sorry, uh, we're still on question one. I, yeah. If anybody wants any of these, just email right. me at jcquinn at queensda.org and I'll send them all to you. But the, the, uh, the, the notion that this is going to cost $10.7 billion to rebuild Rikers, well, Actually, the Lippman Commission said that that's the amount of money that it would cost, but they would finance it over 30 years, and it would actually wind up costing $23 billion when you add in the, uh, the interest and the financing charges, which comes out to $770 million a year, which comes out to $150,000 for each one of the 5,000 inmates on Rikers. So you're increasing the cost from, from $240,000 a year, which is what Lippman said it would cost, cost now, you're increasing the cost for maintaining the inmates to almost $400,000 a year. Why Rikers has to be closed and demolished and not reformed and repaired, I don't know. It could be done a lot cheaper, a lot faster, with a lot less political capital having to be spent, and a lot safer for the people of the city of New York. I don't understand it. I think the, the debate has, has gotten mired in, uh, in, in things that have nothing to do with the actual closing of Rikers and the processing of the prisoners in the, in the system. Uh, thank you, James. And um, we have about 20 minutes left. I would like to get to audience questions. So I'm going to have to be a little bit selective uh, with who gets to respond. Um, first, I'd, I'd like to hear from uh, Elizabeth, um, the, the city's perspective. Then um, I think Elias, will, you have a word as well. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to be quick and just address one thing, because I know people are going to address others. Um, I think it's a mistake and not right to say that the way in which we're going to reduce the population is by releasing lots and lots of dangerous people. That's a scare tactic. Mm -hmm. We, <laughs> I completely agree with Jim that the, and with Elias, that the population inside looks very different than it did 20 years ago. There aren't low-level drug folks in there. There aren't turnstile jumpers. There aren't prostitutes, et cetera. Um, it is more serious crimes. But 
two things happen in order to reduce the population. One, you reduce the number of people who go in. And we've been very successful in doing that. That population has come down 20%, while the crime rate has also come down in the last four years. And we do that uh, in a whole array of ways uh, that you know the proof is in the pudding. But the second thing is, so what do we do with respect to people charged with violent offenses who stay for long periods of time? The answer that the city has is we're not releasing them. They're going through the same process, but we must speed up the way in which justice is delivered in this city. Uh, for, for every person, for every day that we can cut off case delay, we save 100 beds. But the courts have to kick in, <laughs> the prosecutors have to kick in, the defenders have to kick in, and we have to raise the bar of justice while we ensure that we deliver it in a way that is speedy. Okay, Elias, and then we'll hear from Councilman Williams and we'll move on to the next point. I, I understand <clears throat> what uh, Ms. Glazer just said, and this is the problem. The only uh, thing that we are hearing about is New York City correction officers. She said what she said, but who's talking about the district attorneys? That's right. Who's talking about uh, the judges in That's the right. court system? Everyone is only focusing on right. and talking about corrections and correction officers as if we are the one who put these people right. in our custody. Right. If we took custody of 65,000 New Yorkers last year, we don't have 65,000 people in our custody. Those are, that's the revolving door that goes on. But there is no panel. Every panel that I've seen, every advocate that I hear, they're not talking about the district attorneys. They are not talking about the judges who are, who are giving these sentences. They're only talking about what happens when they get to corrections. And I absolutely stand by what I say. Corrections is the last stop on the criminal justice train. We are the last stop. It does stop with us. I get what, what Powers is saying, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're not here to talk about what happens after they go back into the street. We're talking about the New York City Department of Corrections and what's happening with us. The average inmate, we know, stays in this custody for about 60 days. So out of the 65,000 people that was in our custody, most of them are there two weeks, three weeks, uh, one month, two months. They don't stay in our custody. But we have to talk about the safety. We cannot continue to talk about corrections and not talk about safety. Matter of fact, we can't talk about corrections and not talk about safety. We have to talk about safety. The, the funeral that I went to yesterday, like I said, in Pennsylvania, that correction officer was kicked and stomped to death by an 18-year-old inmate. A year ago, the correction officer that was killed in Delaware was killed by a bunch of inmates. And the same thing that was going on in Delaware and the same thing that's going on in Pennsylvania is going on here. And the union is saying, we're going to end up in the same situation if we don't address safety, if we don't stop this nonsense about how long it's going to take to close the jail down. I don't care whether it's going to take a year or two years. What I care about is can my officers come to work and go home the way they came? Can the inmates who get arrested go home the way they came? That's my concern. Can the civilian who got five of his teeth knocked out by another 18-year-old, can that civilian go home the way they came to work? And the problem is, again, no one wants to talk about what it is that we have to do with this population of inmates. We have to do something about them, and you have to give us. We should not have to beg. We should not have to beg the city council. We shouldn't have to beg the mayor to give us back or give us the tools that we need. Listen, personal, personal note for me. I went to testify before the assembly in Auburn, real quick. And I explained to the black and Puerto Rican caucus that I was testifying before that I have a sister, a baby sister, who's a New York City correction officer. And I have a son who's a correction officer. And I have a nephew and a brother-in-law who's a correction officer. But my youngest brother and my oldest brother are inmates. I don't want my mother, aunt, anybody getting a call about any of them, whether they're regardless 
of what they're behind the bars for. Mm -hmm. So the union has been the only one calling for safer jails and doing this in a safer manner. So forgive my, you know, uh, what do you call it? Passion. passion. <laughs> Forgive my passion. But I have to be passionate because every night I go to sleep and I don't sleep well. Because I don't want the call that one of my gods have been killed because you people are not doing what, the, what you're supposed to do for us. Uh, a final point on that question from Councilman Williams and we'll move on. Yeah, um, but so one, I always want to make sure, I mean, there's something that I disagree with Elias on, but the, the main point about there are real people being killed and hurt, including corrections officers, should not be lost in anyone. So we should not demonize everybody. Uh, there is a system in place that encourages that. And so that's a problem for me. When I've spoken to him personally, he doesn't feel he's at the table enough. And so again, I hope that the city will reach out and make sure he is there because they are, they are in, in danger, just like the inmates are in danger because of the way the system is. But I just wanted to be clear, um, what happened with those charge is what commonly happens. There was a dehumanization of the people we are talking about, referred to as widgets and inmates and uh, what has happened to them before. Uh, and I'm gonna say that because uh, there are some DAs that I think um, uh, did never saw a system that locked up black and brown people enough uh, that they didn't like, and I think the Queens DA is one of them. I don't know this particular senior DA, so I, have, uh, I can't say anything about it. But those type conversations, I think, take us backwards. We need that information, I will say that. But we need to say it in a human way to understand what happens to human beings, as uh, Elias is pointing out, what happened to them before they got there, why are there such repeating? Why no one stepped in with any type of restorative justice or other ways? The problem is we come in with the mindset that everybody needs to be in jail. The answer for all of these things are locking people up. That's the type of thing that we have to reverse. Unfortunately, doing that is a difficult task. And with respect to my colleague, uh, uh, Council Member uh, Holden, uh, the reason he's here is because my former colleague, Council Member Crowley, supported the plan uh, for uh, Rikers uh, Island and was punished for that. We have to start rewarding people who are trying to change the dynamic and the discussion. So to say cutting this in half is irresponsible, I think itself is irresponsible because we're not discussing whether or not these folks should be in jail or not. We're talking about a number. There are other things that can be done even with some of those people who we dehumanized on that chart. As was mentioned, some of them are going to smaller jails, just not Rikers. There's also angle braces and other things that can happen. So I just want to start from the framework of let's just agree at some point that not everything needs to be answered by more prison, by more arrests. And I think that helps keep everyone safe when we take law enforcement in jail and make sure it's not synonymous with public safety, that public safety is a much broader discussion. And uh, we had a comment about the Queen's DA's office. So uh, James Quinn, if you want to yeah. respond. Councilman. I have been an assistant DA for 40 years. I have sat with more women of color to explain to them how the justice system works and what they have to do because their son or their daughter was murdered. I'm about to start a trial of a woman who was nine months pregnant, a woman of color who was stabbed by her boyfriend. She was nine months pregnant. Both she and the baby were murdered. The case was reversed. Ten it happened 10 years ago. I've been working for the last month on putting that case together to get it to trial. Don't tell me that my system, my, my, my office, or me are, are insensitive to putting people in jail. You are insensitive. We have. We have I've been black for 41 Councilman, years. Councilman, you don't know anything um, about me. And I want to tell you. You know uh, nothing about me, Councilman. I have worked with more mothers who have children who have died by gun violence whether it's people who look like them or police officers. I'm telling you, when you look and talk to victims, the biggest thing they want is for it not to happen to someone else. But what you do is use their pain to help lock up other black and Councilman, brown people. Councilman, you, you have no idea what you're talking about I when you're talking about I have a lot of office. idea what I'm talking about. And with about. all due respect, Councilman, we have, we have 30 different alternative sentencing programs in my office. I appreciate we, that. We have dozens Your of people. Your presentation? was insensitive No, my presentation was factual. I'm going to have to jump in. Uh, it was think. factual. Well, I understand that. I, Excuse I, me. I, 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 just, I just have to say something. We're going we're gonna to move on but to wait, the next no, point. John, I, I just have to say something. Okay. The same thing that Jamani is saying that is being done to the people or inmates on these 
uh, posters is exactly what they're doing to New York City correction officers. Look, at the end of the day, this debate about, listen, in the black community, we have crime right. and we have criminals and they should be in jail and we should do something with them. So I'm not going to, I don't want to sit here and I don't want anybody to think that I'm under the impression that because the, the people in jail are black, that they don't belong there because they're black. Listen, in the black community, we are victims of people who commit crimes and something should be done with them. I don't think, not in defense of, of Quinn, but I don't think he's the one who invented the laws. I think the city council make laws. I think the, 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 the assembly and the senate make laws and I think they're, they're there like us to enforce those laws. So at the end of the day, we have to be cognizant of the fact that everybody in jail is not a choir boy. The DA and has a lot the of them, Jamani, that's there belong how there. Those laws are applied. Let's just be clear. The DA is probably the strongest person that can deal with this. I agree there is crime. They get their laws and their rules I, from I, you guys. I, I agree that there is crime in the black community. It is how we deal with that crime is the question. So um, I am not against. Some people need a timeout. I'm not against jail as per se. Then you I'm, support punitive segregation because I, that's a timeout. No, but but that's a timeout. What out. that refers to is uh, solitary, and we have understood. What I'm not opposed to, uh, some of the things that you said are taken away, I'm not sure all of those things have been taken away, to, to, my, to the chagrin of some of my um, uh, uh, advocates. But I know that solitary itself damages the mind. We have proven that. So that should not be a thing. Well, that's not that a problem because we don't have solitary confinement on right. Rikers Island. And I think that the inmate that got the 250 stitches probably would disagree with you. Okay, moving forward, moving forward. Well, we can point to any there one person or any one incident to prove our point. Sorry. No, but I just want to talk about a system in Councilman, I'm, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to cut this off, move on. There are two more points I wanted to cover, uh, then we'll see if we have time for questions from the audience. Um, the borough president made an interesting point about uh, if you were to close Rikers and, and move it to these four borough based facilities, how you avoid transferring the same problems, the same culture. Um, and, and Councilman Holden talked about should we explore rebuilding on Rikers Island. Um, why, why isn't that being part of the discussion? So I'd like to ask uh, Elizabeth, um, you know, how do you avoid that? It, it, it's the same, many of the same inmates, many of the same correction officers. How do you avoid transferring that culture? And to what degree is it also a structural problem? All right, this isn't just about building buildings. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, something different has to happen inside. And there are a lot of people doing a lot of work on this from uh, you know, the officers, to the staff, to the mayor, to the council, uh, to make that happen. Uh, whether it's physical improvements, or adding five hours a day of programming, or addressing needs of the officers, of course more must be done. But there does have to be a critical shift in what happens inside um, in order to make sure that we're not simply relocating the same issues that we're dealing with now on Rikers Island. So sh shouldn't you revamp the courts first before you announce we're, we're going to close Rikers and reduce the population to 5,000 without first addressing the courts, the problems in the courts, the length of time? that uh, people have to be well, I think it has to happen all simultaneously. Well, uh, if it doesn't, if what we're doing is going to do everything sequentially, uh, it, we will never get there. And uh, so we are addressing the problems in the courts. Right now there's uh, been for uh, two or three years a very focused effort on reducing that length of stay. There's been a big reduction in the number of people who stay for very long periods of time at Rikers, um, but there needs to be a much more systemic look at why it is folks who are there for those shorter periods uh, are staying for as long. Uh, and that's a big issue. But all these things have to happen at once. There are a lot of issues here. It's a big and complicated problem, and we have to fire on every cylinder uh, to address them. And I have one more question uh, before uh, we'll go to questions for the audience. Uh, our staff will be carrying cards around. If you want a card, just raise your hand. You can write down your question. Uh, and we'll, again, try to get to at least a couple of them. Um, my next point is uh, we heard some discussion about um, the move to these borough-based facilities. Um, obviously, there are already existing sites in Manhattan, in, from Brooklyn. We heard from Elias about some of the uh, 
violence at those sites. I'm wondering if we could hear more about those locations. Are they, are they more up to date? Uh, what is the situation? Is it better? Is it worse than Rikers Island? Um, and again, Elizabeth, if you could start and then maybe a couple others on that front. Sure, so these are old facilities uh, built in an old way. Um, they are not uh, as up to date as they should be. They don't have uh, opportunities for programming or the right kind of space for staff. Uh, and we're engaged in a very intense pro process right now, and there are a number of people in the audience engaged in that, Liz Gaines, uh, Stanley Richards, uh, a whole host of folks. Um, in order to figure out what the spaces look like, what needs to be done in each site, what the options are, and crucially to be able to engage with neighborhoods and elected officials uh, in order to do this process together. Um, so this is something that has to happen with everyone, um, with officers, with staff, uh, with neighborhoods. Uh, but that's exactly the issue before us right now. <coughs> and, we, and we need to uh, really look at, um, you know, how, how do we reshape uh, these facilities? And I, I think about Brooklyn House of Detention, uh, where we can restructure, and that's important to do. And so we can't just uh, close um, any facility and expect to move into this existing footprint. It's not the right footprint to do so. And I think that you saw some of the inter interactions here. There are several schools of thought of public safety. And the first art of addressing this is that we have to listen to each other. We have to first seek to understand, then to be understood. We cannot dig in like many people have on both sides of this issue. We've dug in. We're not even hearing each other. And we need to take a moment. We need timeouts and say, how do we do this together? No one in this room wants to see an innocent person harm. It doesn't matter if it's the innocent person is a correction officer, an inmate, or a civilian. But when we become just as belligerent and believe our position is the only position, we're never going to get to the place that we ought to believe. Because our life experiences is going to give us a different approach to this concept, and the life we live is going to give us a different approach. Let's have real civil conversations on how to do this the right way. There are no bad guys in here. They're different philosophy based on lifestyles and based on what we have encountered. And that is the only way we're going to get to the solution of this, not to try to demonize each other in the process. Enough demonization takes place on our streets and in our jails. Those of us who are here to serve and protect should not be part of that demonization. And, and can I, Councilman Powers? Yeah. yeah, can I just add, and I wanted to share the, the thoughts from the borough president, which is that, and I think Councilmember Holden mentioned that we might have different ideas of where the jail should go, stay or, or don't, but you know, Councilmember Borelli, Councilmember Holden, myself, and many others, bipartisan, are at, just, just sign on to a letter to advocate for more safety measures in, uh, through body scanners and other ways uh, through Albany. I think if we committed ourselves, uh, as much as we are committing to the closure of Rikers Island, which I, I am committed to, uh, to actually enacting the reforms that we talked about also that are much needed in Albany, whether it's about trials or bail reform, and a lot, I mean, everybody up here, I think, has sort of said and agreed on the fact that there are other things beyond Rikers Island that are necessary in order to address our criminal justice system and ensure safety. If we all commit ourselves to that as well, I think we will see significant progress. I, I, I would admit, I think that the Rikers Island thing has taken up a big part of the conversation about, about what's going on right now. And in fact, safety and security needs and, 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 and ensuring that people that perhaps don't belong there don't end up there uh, is a really part of that, big part of that conversation. So everybody who's talking about Rikers Island needs to also be committed to all these other issues that uh, will ensure that the people in there are safe, that the people working there are safe. And I'd like to see out of this room today and everybody up here some consensus on a few, a few ideas even in Albany or in the city that we can even agree on. 
that is about safety and security that we can move forward and all advocate together because the closure of Rikers Island is important. It's important to me and to some others, but um, but ensuring that all these other things happen and, and Council Member Holden brings up a good point, which is we have to be advocating for these other things as well. Uh, that's got to be part of the conversation now and, uh, and, and should be part of the conversation in addition to what we're talking about at Rikers Island. Sure, and, and one follow-up on that. Um, with these existing facilities in Manhattan and Brooklyn, um, I, I wonder if that's kind of like a, a test case for these supposed problems that you would have of, of siting uh, borough-based facilities. Um, are there problems? Is there a security issue? Is it, is it more about property values? Um, any, any thoughts on that, on that front? So one, um, nobody wants a jail next to them, primarily. There are certain things people just don't want <coughs> next to them. I might feel uncomfortable if, uh, if there's a jail put next to me. That doesn't mean we, we should not move forward. And so one of the things I want to make sure happens is that um, communities are more engaged in discussion. Uh, I've seen not just from, um, from shelters to everything. I think sometimes it's imposed without a discussion. So I do want to see a better discussion with these communities before we just jump in with the understanding that everybody, if everybody says no, it won't happen. And so I, that those two things have to be understood. It shouldn't be just imposed, it should be discussion, uh, but it has to happen. Uh, and just to respond, I, I, I do agree a lot with what just said my colleague and, and the borough president, but I do, I do want to point out, not but, at the same time I want to point out there are some philosophies that have uh, disabused black and brown communities for a very long time. Those philosophies, I don't know how much respect to put into it. Um, so I just want to um, rehumanize a certain population. and We've treated them a certain way. Uh, I don't know Mr. Quinn, so I, I can't personally say anything. I have watched the DA from Queens uh, for a long time and just not impressed in terms of how to reverse systemic and historic things that have happened in particular communities. And we are um, over the time limit. Is, is, are all the panelists able to stay for five or ten more minutes to take audience questions? If anyone needs to leave for another commitment, feel free to go. How about five minutes? Yeah. Five minutes? We'll do five minutes. Okay. And I have, I mean, we could go another hour with all the questions I have here. But uh, from a correction officer, what is the destiny of correction officers who rely on their career to support their family while drastic reform is happening? 10,000 correction officers won't fit in five small facilities in New York City. So I, I do want to be clear also, um, I know a lot of corrections officers as well, and they are often afraid. Uh, I, I don't want to see anyone hurt. And I, I want to make sure we elevate the correction officer's voice in this, because violence is violence, as I said. And I know many folks. I don't want inmates hurting each other. I don't want uh, the numbers lessened. I don't want, uh, it's a disservice not to get this right and put uh, corrections officers in there to try to fix things that need a complex fix. So I just want to say that. Um, I do, I'm not sure, and the correction officers are not going to be happy, I'm not sure if job preservation is a paramount. I want there to be job preservation, but I think safety and the best way to do this has to be what we look at first um, and then try to figure out. I don't want anyone to lose their jobs, particularly as a union, as was mentioned, as black and brown. So we have to think about that. Um, but I think we have to think about how to do this the best way we can uh, in terms of making correction officers and inmates safe. Okay, another question. Uh, there are currently uh, pretrial justice packages in Albany from Cuomo, the Senate Dems, and Assembly addressing bail, speedy trial, and discovery. Advocates are supporting changes with an eye to reducing the pretrial population in jails. What are you all doing to support these measures? And, and I'd also be curious, uh, how likely do you think these are to pass? And, and Councilman Borelli, you've spent some time in Albany. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think what goes unsaid oftentimes is that many of the inmates uh, are using the criminal justice system to delay their own trials uh, and inadvertently extending their own time on, on Rikers Island. Uh, I'm sure uh, Mr. Quinn could probably uh, back me up on that. Um, you know, should, should we have a shorter period through discovery, through trials, through the, the, the plea portion of uh, any defendant's process? Certainly. Should it come at the expense uh, of potentially denying someone their due process? I'm not sure. You know, so I'm not sure. I don't know where the Senate Republicans uh, go with this, primarily uh, because I, I don't know if the Senate Republicans will be in the majority tomorrow, never mind uh, next week. Um, you know, I think that is the, uh, the entity that is preventing this from going forward. Um, so other than reading the tea leaves there, I'm not really sure. 
Yeah, and I, I just, I mean, just because I commented on this, I mean, <clears throat> I think in the in the council side, we've tried to prioritize. We do a budget, we do a, a, a response to Albany on priorities that we'd like to see passed. And as I asked for a number of these to be included in our package, the body scanners bill, the uh, speedy trial, and, and the bail reform. So I think on the council side, we advocate, but we can only ask for, we can ask, but that doesn't mean we're guaranteed. From do I think they'll all be passed? I, I think probably not, because at the end of the day, this becomes a three-person negotiation, or a four-person negotiation around these. I, li I hope, I hope that we will see some reforms made. And like, and bills that are, would guarantee the safety of the correction officers and the inmates should be no-brainers. Sure, and then just uh, two final questions from the audience. What can be done to physically design safer correctional facilities? I mean, I'll, I'll start with that, I mean, you know. Visiting Rikers uh, and seeing many of the different prisons, um, you know, this is going to sound ridiculous, but you can watch a prison show on TV and, and just with the naked eye, not even being an expert, uh, see how uh, in a place that's as dated as, as some of the jails on Rikers, there's more interaction between correction officers and inmates. And when you look at the incident that, that occurred and the attack on Jean Souffrant, um, lessening the likelihood that that there could be four inmates uh, in a sealed environment with someone who's potentially going to be the victim of attack would make the jail safer. You know, um, that should be the major focus of the discussion on how to rebuild jails. That shouldn't be the, the, the secondary or tertiary concern. That should be the number one concern. And I think anyone, whether you're on the right or, or left, w would be in favor of that. And that's why even when I, when I started out, I, I started out by saying I, I'm not opposed to closing Rikers Island for the, for the sake of closing Rikers Island. Um, I just think the priority needs to be on ensuring that the jails are built in a modern style with uh, safety measures that reduce the impact on correction officers. I'm sorry. There should be an inclusion of, uh, I mean, we got to really think outside the box, some of the stuff they're doing in Pennsylvania where they, they're looking at um, how giving uh, inmates a nutrition-based diet, mm -hmm. how it has altered behavior um, on what we're feeding and how it assists in the development of a person. And so we need to go across the country and look at best mm -hmm. practices. What are other people doing in a humane fashion to ensure that a person who commits some form of violent action uh, is able to serve his time with a level of dignity and they don't come out uh, more broken than when they went in? And so I think there's other states and, uh, that are doing it the right way. We have not. We have done it the wrong way for far too many years. And, and uh, in Albany, if you're looking for the cavalry to come, let me just give you the sad reality is not. Hmm. Um, even if the Democrats take control of the uh, Senate, uh -oh. um, you still have within the Democratic um, conference a fraction uh -oh. who don't believe in, um, you know, this, some of this reform, you know, they don't, they represent Keep counties real. Where, where they don't. So I don't see anything coming out of Albany in the area of bail reform, in the area of prison reform. I don't see anything coming out of in Albany that's going to assist in any way on what we're attempting to do here in the city. If we can't do it on our own, uh, don't expect for it to happen. Albany's not a place that is going to happen. All right, Elias and then Councilman Holden. I think what, what, what's important is I just came back, like I said, from Pennsylvania. The funeral of a correction officer who was killed or murdered by an inmate. I think what people need to understand is wherever you go in this country, wherever we have jails and prisons, we have violence. And the reality is the design of the jail is not what determines whether it's going to be a safe jail or not. Uh, inmates, officers, everybody have to have the understanding that uh, crime will not be tolerated. Everybody have to understand that there are rules and that rules have to be followed. So regardless of the, the design of the jail, the jail in Pennsylvania is designed, it's a much newer jail, but it didn't stop this inmate from stomping this correctional officer out to death. The jail in Delaware is a much newer jail, but it didn't stop those inmates from almost decapitating that correction officer. So most of the areas where they have low, low, low level of violence, the inmates, the officers, everybody understand the consequences 
of not following the rules or obeying the law. And I think that that's something that we here just cannot ignore. We can't ignore that everyone have to understand that there are consequences regardless of the design of the jail. So You're I, not going to design a jail where I'm not yeah. going to have any contact with an inmate. Sorry, Councilman Holden, then yes, briefly. But the, the reality here, though, is to, if you're modernizing a facility, you need more space. Uh, you need, if you go on, on to Rikers, you see how tight the quarters are. Um, you, you look at, at the situation of, that the uh, uh, corrections officers have to go into the facility. I, I, I think, Elias, you talked about the LA County's jail, how the, yes. the, the actual corrections officers really don't come in, into contact very much. Very little contact. And they're safer. But Rikers, and again, I, I, I haven't heard an argument Everybody's saying close Rikers. Well, rebuild Rikers. You have the you have the space. Yes, you do. In the borough base, you don't have the space. No, Nobody's no. talking about that. You don't have space in Kew Gardens. Period. You don't have space for the parking. You don't have space for. Uh, it's congested now there. Rikers, on the other hand, 414 acres. I just can't understand why the under the banner close Rikers. Rebuild Rikers. Rebuild it to a modern facility where everyone is safer and it's a better environment for all. I mean, does, that makes sense, I think. Thank you. So, um, um, well, I just want to say I've, I've never been a corrections officer and I've never been an inmate of Rikers. And so I try to defer to voices uh, that have been those. So I respect Eli's voice a lot and other corrections officers. I take time to hear what is being said. And so what I would say uh, in terms of what Rikers look like is I think at the top of it, we do have to make sure that we are humanizing people. And so if the layout can um, uh, help lead to that, then that's what we have to look at. If there's a place that's off to the side that no one thinks about that's donk dank, it, 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 it doesn't help humanize. So whatever can help humanize in whatever shape, uh, and including correction officers, I do want to humanize them as well coming to do their job, to feed their families, and they just want to get home. And so that's a voice that I think is important. But in humanizing, we have to remember, young black and brown people aren't born genetically predisposed to crime or genetically uneducable. And so the question of why the high percentage of them are there has to be answered as well. Before we get to corrections officers, before we even get to Rikers, I also hope, we should, I think we should rename Rikers, that's another, another debate, and it's not a correction, so we have to rename that as well. But with that said, it's important that we have those discussions. I do think we, do, we have to listen more, um, but whatever we can do to humanize people, even quote unquote criminals, because once you can't hurt people unless you dehumanize them. And so the language you use describing people who are in Rikers or people who are in this system and either side once you're using language that is less than humanizing, then you can do a lot of things to those people and not feel bad, and that is important. All right, that's a good note to close on. Uh, we are out of time, but this is a passionate discussion, a robust discussion. Let's give our panel a hand.